Hey HK fans, James here with another Target of Opportunity video. Uh, we're out here once again at Frontline Defense Range getting ready to kick off two days and nights of our Advanced Concealed Carry course. And I thought I would take advantage of the range time to bring you another video of a rare HK weapon that uh, many of you have probably never heard of. And if you have heard of it, you probably haven't gotten to see much about this weapon. So what is that weapon? Well, it's the HK-512 shotgun. And I'm so excited about doing a video on a shotgun. I actually wore my duck hunting jacket out here to kind of get in the mood. Um, but what is the HK-512 shotgun? Well, as you can see, it is a 12 gauge semi-automatic uh, shotgun with lovely wood stocks and a deep uh, black finish, a seven round ex extended uh, magazine tube and a very unique muzzle device that I'll get to here uh, in a minute for you. Okay, so you're probably asking yourself, hey James, I didn't even know that H&K made a shotgun. Well, it really depends on your definition of the word made. Okay, this shotgun actually comes from a requirement from the late 1970s that I'll discuss here in detail shortly. Um, but H&K, when they received this requirement, they wanted to respond to it, but they didn't really have experience in designing and manufacturing a shotgun. But what they did have was a great working relationship with a company uh, called Franke. And if you've heard the name Franke before, it's probably associated with that 80s uh, icon of shotgun, the SPAS-12, or their LAW-12 or SAS-12 shotguns that they were producing. They're a well-known Italian uh, shotgun manufacturer, and H&K at the time was serving as their German uh, export um, company. So, they went to Franke and said, hey, we want to build this shotgun. Will you help us? They worked with them on the design. Um, and all of the actual parts were manufactured there in Italy. And then because of German regulations as far as manufacturing, selling uh, the, the weapon systems out of a German company, those parts were then transported to H&K's factory in Obendorf. They were assembled, test fired, proofed, and then marketed and sold through H&K. Um, so if you look really close at the weapon, uh, you'll see here on the right side of the receiver the actual markings for H&K's uh, factory, and you can really see kind of a Cold War throwback. Uh, the country it's actually marked West Germany, which is kind of neat. And you'll also see H&K Model 512. Again, because this um, was a weapon that was um, you know, made, the parts were made in Italy. If you look on the uh, left side of the receiver, very small lettering down here by the trigger guard, it also says Franke Italy. And because this specific model here in my hands was imported into the U.S. not through H&K, but through a secondary importer, those import marks are also here on, on the weapon. So that's the what behind the weapon. Now let's talk about the why. Okay, well that comes out of a requirement from the late 1970s that I mentioned. And as I've talked about in some of my other videos, this was a very uh, interesting time within Europe and specifically, uh, specifically Germany with uh, the, the wake of the Munich Olympic massacre and the rise of, of radical terrorism that's sweeping across uh, Europe. Uh, Germany specifically used this as kind of an awakening and with their police and security forces they took a hard look at the reorganization of their forces, the tactics, and the weaponry that they were going to need to counter this new threat. And for Germany specifically they stood up an organization called GSG-9 which was a counter-terrorist uh, police unit out of their border guard and that organization really locked arm in arm with H&K to become that weapons provider. So H&K gave them their P9S pistols and then P7 pistols and then their full complement of roller delayed blowback weapons and specifically what we saw most often used by them was the MP5 submachine gun and it was working with GSG-9 that they got the requirements that led to your MP5 SD and the MP5K. So it is not surprising that GSG-9 when they were looking for a shotgun would also come back to H&K for a requirement. And uh, and again, not surprising to see at the time a police organization wanted to use a shotgun, um, nor is it uh, at this period either. But most often when we see that, it's usually a pump action shotgun. And the reason behind that being that it's more of a jack of all trades utilitarian type uh, weapon in a pump shotgun format that can reliably cycle the full range of cartridges that a law enforcement organization may want to shoot. So from the very low pressured um, 
uh, non-lethal weapons, uh, or I'm sorry, non-lethal munitions to door busting rounds to the very high pressured uh, buckshot and slug rounds. You've got to have a full range of that. What's interesting about the GSG-9 requirement is they didn't care about any of that other stuff. What they wanted was a weapon that was going to be reliable, would fire as fast as possible, hence the semi-auto nature of this weapon. But specifically, they were only caring about it killing bad guys. Um, so that kind of leads us to this unique muzzle device. And that really is the challenge when we think about a shotgun um, in this type of role. So for the GSG-9, they're doing counterterrorism mission. They're doing CQB, hostage rescue type stuff. Well, the benefit of a shotgun when you're using uh, something other than a slug is with one pull of the trigger, you get multiple um, projectiles coming out of that barrel. That's obviously a benefit. You can get uh, more chance that you're gonna hit the target and more chance that you're gonna incapacitate that target when you hit it. Okay, that's great, but kind of the disadvantage from a CQB, stand, uh, CQB standpoint is that that pattern is going to spread. And when we're looking at wanting to hit a bad guy who may be right here and not hit a good guy who's on his left and his right, having more of a separation in that spread of pattern may be not as ideal. From a traditional circular style uh, pattern barrel, you're gonna get a circular pattern of, of the shot being fired. And some of that shot may end up being outside of the torso range of that intended target, especially if that target might be bladed off. So not as ideal. And we've seen uh, choke tubes used for like uh, bird hunting, where it'll create more of an horizontal oval pattern that allows you to get the leading and trailing edge on a bird and, and, and likely uh, improve the likelihood of impacting that, that wouldn't be good in a CQB type situation either. Uh, so what they did with the 512, which is really unique, and we'll show you a close up here of this muzzle device, is if you look at the business end of it, they, um, they actually created a device at the end of the weapon that creates a vertical uh, pattern. Um, where it's, it's almost rectangular or oval in shape, but allows that pattern to now effectively go from belt line to neckline on a torso target and be very much more narrow focus. So whether the target's presenting himself uh, full on like this or in a bladed area, but I've got a greater likelihood that I can distribute all that pattern right exactly where I want it. Okay, so to give kind of a visual representation of that 512 and the muzzle device, I wanted to do a quick on-range comparison. I've got my trusty Benelli M1 uh, entry gun. Obviously, this is a short barrel shotgun uh, with a, a standard uh, pattern barrel, no special muzzle devices, so it's not a, an exact match uh, for the length of the 512, but it'll give us a representation. So I've set up uh, targets down here. We're going to fire uh, a Winchester double-aught buck, 12-gauge uh, round. We'll see the effects of this and then we'll run it with the 512. Okay. Now using that same ammunition with our 512, let's see what the muzzle device does. Okay, let's go take a look. Okay, so here we are at the targets. Obviously, this is the first one I, sh I shot with the Benelli M1, 15 yards using our double-op buck, and as I predicted, a very circular uh, pattern of, uh, of separation there of the shot. Now, again, very effective. Nothing really wrong with this. If it was a man-sized torso, looks like all that would be in. But if I'm looking from CQB type uh, distances and, and hostage rescue type situations like GSG-9 was using, what happens if maybe that target was bladed off or you had a bad guy here, but he was holding hostage somebody to the left or the right? Well, maybe these out, outer shells impacts, uh, I'm sorry, projectile impacts might not be as ideal. Hopefully that makes sense. Now, let's look over here at the 512. Again, same round, same distance, but now you can see a definite vertical separation, kind of, again, from the belt line to the neckline of the impact, much more narrowly focused. So as long as I'm putting the center of the sight on the center of the bad guy, whether he's bladed off or he's got a hostage, you know, over on the left, the right side, I've got a much more uh, likely chance that I'm going to impact and incapacitate him and not affect the others. So 
I think we've kind of proven in a very simple test and evaluation. Obviously, we could do this much more in depth using different types of weapons, different types of uh, buckshot loads at different distances. But the point really was just to showcase the unique muzzle device on a very rare H&K shotgun uh, for you here today. So, first of all, I'd like to thank my good buddy Greg. Uh, this is his uh, 512 he sent to me here so I can do an overhaul service on it. Was kind enough to allow me to bring it out here before that service, shoot this video in it uh, specifically. So thanks again, Greg. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Um, as always, I'm humbled to share my knowledge and experience with y'all. If you're in need of H&K services support or unique training opportunities like this advanced concealed carry course we're about to kick off here today, give me a shout. That's what I'm here for. Thanks, guys.